A warm welcome to all the panelists, management, faculty and the students. Thank you for taking your time out to attend the Bespoke Show. Bespoke is defined as something that is custom made. The Bespoke Show is an initiative conceptualized to live up to this dictionary definition. It is neither another need to inspirational talk nor it is a platform to share longer than life personal stories. TBS is a forum for candid discussion on topics of interest covering conventional and non-conventional sectors. Mainstream and offbeat careers, arts and literature, media and entertainment and even the international affairs. Before we begin, may I request Dr. Madhavinda Chatterjee, Director of PGDM, to deliver the welcome note. So, it's in the first time in ABBS that we are doing this. And uh, I must take this opportunity to welcome all our dignitaries who have come here and sparing their time. So, Group Captain, Tad uh, TPS Gill, we welcome you, sir. Group Captain, Mr. It's uh, indeed innovative on their part that uh, they have started doing this with the academic institutions and the corporate, now finding out the things that we actually need and providing the platform to discuss this, as they said, as candidly as possible. And aviation is going to be the next big thing as we believe, as we watch this business world, we realize that uh, aviation is going to be one of the big industries and there are many challenges that aviation industry will face down the line <coughs> along with the concept of uh, you know, carbon footprint and uh, how, how to reduce it and yet we need to travel, business has to happen, supply chains are going to become longer. So this is going to be a, a wonderful experience for us I'm sure when these concepts will be discussed because our students are going to look at the management and operation sides of this aviation industry they, some of them uh, may go into technical later on in life, but presently they are all doing their graduation. So they are going to be actually initiated into the management and operations angles of this aviation. So they will probably have more questions on those areas. And uh, it would be interesting for them to know what is the future they can look forward to. And as we say, Choti Shi Asa, Upar Jana Hi Apne Ko Urne Ki Asha. So, aviation is all about moving ahead, going up. But how do we do it? Because this is an industry we haven't really spoken much about. And uh, it has never been a part of management education as it is today. So, the importance is realized because today universities, institutions, all are talking about the management aspect not the technical aspect so much. So I'm sure both the captains will give us the helicopter view as they said of all the things that happen in aviation and I'm sure they will have this wonderful objective way of letting us know where operations and how management are going to make the aviation industry much better. And technology as uh, one of uh, Mr. Gaurav Agarwal was telling us is going to run this show. So is it the technical area also that you all can enter, especially in the analytics area because data is going to drive the next big thing and you know how today you are buying tickets online which we couldn't think of, we had to go to an agent, the agent would book the ticket or you went to the airline's office and booked it. Today we have moved to that but it is going to be further on as I was reading, probably it will get sold in Amazon, the tickets. Uh, we can't see it happening now but it might. So the, the other side, that is the technical side which all of you will probably get into, which is the analytics angle of it, which any job will require. So I am sure this is going to be a very, very exciting uh, discussion and please feel free to ask all your questions because this is all about candid discussion, being transparent about your fears, <laughs> your apprehensions, your joyous moments that you are looking for in the future. So thank you all for being here and uh, we look forward to an exciting and informative discussion. Thank you very much.
of diverse perspectives from seasoned leaders about careers and growth opportunity in the Indian aviation sector. May I now request Group Captain Rita T T R T B S, again the founder of CIFAD, to take a seat on the dais. Gill is an A320 instructor who has been with Indigo Airlines in India. He has 46 years of flying experience, including 31 years as a fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force. For the last 10 years, he has been conducting ground training of pilots for the issue of CBL, ATPL, RTR licenses, as well as for the selection process of candidate program and airline jobs. And also, we have Group Captain Archidamram Sir to come to the dais, please. After graduation from National Defense Academy and Air Force Academy, he joined the fighter stream of the Indian Air Force. He has more than 15,000 flying hours to his credit on various types of craft like Boeing 737, MIG-21, Hondo Canberra and various 20 aircraft. After completing 24 years in the Indian Air Force, he joined civil aviation and served in jet airways, Sahara and Spicer. He, pre he is presently doing a voluntary work at an ex service man's health clinic. May I request Dr. H. R. Venkatesha, sir, Director of Management Studies, to welcome Group Captain Hill and Group Captain Arshadamram with the flower pots. He has also worked in a senior role as a strategy advisor at China's HNA Group. Mr. Agarwal is an MBA from Asian Institute of Management, Philippines, and holds a diploma in transport management from National University of Singapore. He is an alumnus of Singapore Aviation Academy. Next, we have with us Ms. Sona Su from Go Air. Now, please take a seat. is the former cabin manager of Jet Airways. She is licensed by Competent Authority of India, DGCA, to fly different fleets B737, A330, ATR72. Ms. Soon has a rich experience of more than 13 years in aviation customer service management. Now, I request Dr. Madhumita Chatterjee to welcome Mr. Agarwal and add Ms. Sonal Su with a flower pot. Ms. Asha Sambar and Mr. Sid Malika jointly host the bespoke show. My request, Asha and Sid, to take a seat on the dais, please. Sir, 
the front. She played the role of managing director of Bank India operations for Indica Premis and European MNC. She is currently an independent director on the board of Toyota Financial Services and an advisory council member of EFI. She has also worked with brands like Kinoskar, Johnson's, etc. Mr. Sid Baliga is a published author in the Times of India, Assam Tribune and several management periodicals. He has been quoted in the Tekken Hallel for his, for his leadership profile development. His books is officially stupid and Behar Kibeti have been widely appreciated for bringing out a strong social message in the people. He has spent more than a decade in education sector and has worked on skill development projects, language training program and many more. May I now request the host to lead the show and give us the insights how we can fly high in the Indian skies. May I request Ms. Kala Sridhar, Assistant Director, Corporate Initiatives and Ms. Niki Mohan, Manager, Corporate Relations to welcome Mr. Sid Baliga and Ms. Asha Sampal to the flower point. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for uh, taking out time on a Saturday afternoon. So, first of all, uh, let me define we spoke. So when we say the we spoke show, we spoke means candid, honest, direct. Uh, so the discussion will be very elaborate, clear, uh, and uh, direct. At the end, you will be given an opportunity to raise questions, uh, which again should be very candid. So whatever questions, however, feel you may some or however uh, dumb it may some, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, directed to the right for people, and with the panel will be happy to answer your questions. So before we start, uh, there is an old adage or old proverb that uh, sky is the limit for some of us, ordinary people who live on our ordinary models. Sky is the limit for most of us. But for people in aviation, sky is the home. Right? Are you Thank you. So keep the class going. Okay. <laughs> So, before we get into details of aviation sector and Nokri on Cloud9 and before we get on to Gadan and stuff, uh, let me start with a very important topic since we have a lot of undergraduate students here and uh, you people might be reading newspaper, getting a lot of uh, maybe negative information, more than positive information in the media because negative information sells faster and travels faster, right? So, we will discuss the aviation paradox in India first, right? On one hand, there are a lot of reports from IATA and uh, other players, other bodies and uh, a lot of internet literature available saying that India is going to be one of the leading aviation markets by 2023-2024, many many different years are quoted in these reports Okay, and it's going to be the third biggest and the second biggest market. That is on one end. And on the other end, we read, read a lot of news about uh, airlines shutting down and no job, people getting laid off and people not getting salary. So obviously you might be confused in your minds ki what is happening, which report do I need right? So with this I would uh, pose this question to Gaurav uh, from the commercial angle. So Gaurav, what do you have to say about this aviation paradox in India first of all? Okay, um, do, I, do I need the mic or? I think, yeah. Okay, um, first of all thank you for having me here. You know I see this question as um, the rest of the world you know, does things this way and India we do it this way. So <laughs> we had cars, you know, fantastic cars coming here first and roads are only getting built now. And likewise in aviation, we have bought thousands of planes or at least uh, yeah, about 800 planes and airports are only getting built now. So uh, there is sometimes a, <clears throat> a mismatch between what uh, is being planned and what is getting delivered on the ground. So, but that shouldn't dishearten you, and that shouldn't um, that shouldn't make you feel this industry doesn't have any any scope. It is prone to shocks. 
um, it is a boom bust industry. Um, <clears throat> but it's certainly not the only industry that has that problem. Today, all the industries that came into being after 91, after, the, after we opened up in a big way, we were a socialist uh, country. Many of, uh, many of you were not born. So to set the context, in 91, we kind of opened up our economy. <clears throat> and we said that we will let these consumer industries uh, you know, come into being. So there is telecom. And uh, a lot of the telecom companies today are suffering. If you read the news, you will know what's happening. It's one of the industries that took hold around 91. So airline is also one of them. Um, to say that there is, so, and, and you've seen some failures in the recent past. You've seen Kingfisher, you've seen Jet Airways, you've seen uh, close, close shave uh, Spice Jet had in 2014, um, but they recovered. So there are reasons for that. There are, we can go into more detail uh, when we discuss other questions. I think our policy is not, uh, government policy is not keeping pace with what the industry can, can do or potentially has, you know, uh, creation of jobs uh, as, as, as possible, as potential. So I would still ask you to remain optimistic. We do things in a different way. We, we, there's a certain mismatch of what we have already got and you know on the ground there's no, no evidence. So there's some mismatch but eventually I do believe as an optimist that the industry will find its way. But at least that's the message I would like to give to you. I, I, you know, I know what the shortcomings of my industry are but uh, for you as somebody who's just coming into the job stream, there are positives. It's an exciting industry to be. Um, I think we mentioned here before that it's going to be the third largest industry. So you should look at it as, as an optimist. Maybe uh, as far as, uh, let's just look at the cost of certain airlines. I would just put it as, if you really do a case study or any of them as managed too much, you will find that uh, mismanagement of the Finance was one of the greatest aspects which came into this. It is not that they predicted growth wrong, we don't. They predicted growth well. And uh, growth also picked up. For example, if you look at the progress of Jet Airways, I was in Spice Jet, but like he said, we did that little miss. And uh, all of us, uh, you know, few of few people left, and I stayed on in Spice Jet when this happened. And uh, we said we could move it forward. Maybe with uh, a reduced strength, cut the flag and uh, get into something better. But that having been said, there are phases where the margins are low. Now contributions to low margins could be a thing like cost of ATF, etc., which I think all of you are well aware. But if you tell me, would this have an adverse effect on our growth in this industry? I say no. We are the sunshine sector. And there is great potential in this sector. And for people like you who are kind of getting into the system now, I won't uh, paint anything other than a bright picture. There are things which you've got to take in the stride as far as your uh, progress in aviation is concerned. But I guess that's what happens in all industries. Yes. OK, uh, both the speakers have already put a great foundation. Let me just add to it what I have to say. First of all, in aviation, if you start from 89, there is always a five year cycle. That means 89 they started, you know, creating more number of airlines. 73 it went down, 98 it came up again, 2003 and thereafter it continued, and 2003 again after 98 for some time it went down. 2003 it came up, 2008 there were crisis, up to 2013 again it came up and 2018 and now we are in 20. So it's a cycle which is very much how it has happened, nothing, nothing new about it. But what already we spoke, person has already spoken in the beginning, 
that there are so many predictions that in India in three years time, actually it was earlier, 2020, it should be the third biggest airline industry in the world. And now it is predicted that 2030, it will become the biggest. So people who are writing this are not specialists. They are not conjecturing, they are not just guessing or guessing. There is some spade work being done. What is the foundation of this paper? In India itself, at the moment, the number of people who could be traveling because of the middle class is such a small percentage that they say we need the way the rate at which it is growing. The way France has predicted 11% or 10% growth rate that we are talking about, the travelers. India needs 70,000 more violence in the next 10 years. To add to it, 1,000 aircraft are waiting to be supplied to various airlines in India. 649 for Indigo, 102 for Go Air, and some 251 for Spicejet. And Air India, we can leave it to the politicians. <laughs> So, as regards that, with these numbers, I will also tell you from each aeroplane, you need at least 14 pilots, right? 7 captains and 7 first officers. So what are we talking about? Is the world just guessing or is it a reality? We will be at the F of F, maybe a downward cycle, but I already mentioned to you about the 5 year cycle in aviation. So therefore, job opportunities are going to be plenty. Why is France, in terms of other things, if you say for the industry, it's not just pilots. If you remember what the Prime Minister said some time back, he said, five years, I want 100 more airfields to be ready. Which are these airfields? Lots of them are greenfield and lots of them are the ones which were used in the Second World War by the Indian Air Force may have been not utilized, recapitulated and may be used. Where are the job opportunities otherwise, let us say, in India? Everywhere it's slowing down. Aviation is one place where everybody would like to create jobs because that is how they can stay in power. Because the accusation is there are no jobs. So if I put all this together, what does it mean? It can't be gloom. It has to be. But we can't be sitting on the fence and thinking that, you know, in terms of when it goes up, that's the time we will start getting qualified. Or has to be qualified and then wait. So, in my view, there is no depression in this. If everyone is predicting, everyone is calculating and saying something. It is not yes or no. So I think there is a bright future. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with what the gentlemen have said. Uh, aviation is a very, very tricky industry. It is. It has a lot of downside and upside, of course. But we cannot. We will be all as ignorant if we just look at the downside of it and we don't look at it what the industry has to offer us. I've been uh, proudly been part of this industry for the last 14 years. Uh, and I would love to continue in the aviation because the kind of opportunities, the sectors, the, the opportunities this industry gives you, it's very difficult. Uh, I would also like to inform you that the promotion the growth hierarchy in aviation industry is faster as compared to any other industry. You get recognized for your work on instant basis. You get promoted on instant basis, which gives you a motivation to work even harder. As Sir said, <coughs> if airline collapses, it's the financial decisions that have gone wrong somewhere, not because they have predicted the growth wrong. We see the sectors these days are coming up 10 years before or 10 years ago. Nobody even knew we had such small towns or cities existing in India. 
but now all the airlines are capturing it because people are traveling. It's a clear sign that people are moving, they, they commute from destination A to destination B without wasting time, and they prefer airline because they are they're the fastest means of traveling. Now we are not just talking about being a pilot or being a crew, there are several other departments which are involved from getting an aircraft up from the ground to flying. So there is absolutely, uh, absolutely nothing to feel demotivated. What we read in articles, we read in newspapers, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and everywhere else in public forums, it's on one side of the story. Aviation is booming up, and it's been predicted to boom up even way better than what it is right now. You can see the prog progression happening at Bangalore Airport itself. Clearly specifies new sectors coming up, airline would require manpower in all other departments too. So please keep up the hopes and uh, looking forward to seeing you, uh, probably most of you, rather all of you, joining the industry. Thank you very much. There is we were talking about this financial and collapses of the airline. I remember in 98, uh, what did Naresh Goel say? He said, if you want to be a millionaire, open an airline as a millionaire and you will become a millionaire soon. <laughs> that is all to do with the management. When you take up, talk of the entities, there are other elements which uh, lead to the collapse, uh, which is the, apart from financial discipline, the company discipline and also in terms of, uh, in terms of, let us say, where are you extending your financial gains? Is it putting back into the airline or is it going somewhere else? The case in point is Vijay Mahathir. Okay. Buying islands, buying yachts, buying, you know, different kind of Formula 1 and all that. With the money that you are maybe generating from from the airline business or whatever it is. So it is to do with how to run an airline. And when it comes to, like I said, why these collapses take place, I would squarely put it on in improper discipline of managing an airline. In terms of whether you have a union, one person gets punished, everybody goes on strike, it doesn't happen. That is what has been happening in Air India. That is what has been happening at JTNS. Then you can't continue with the business like that. So it is to do with proper discipline and financial management if you want to survive. Opportunities are enough. That is all I can say. Thank you. That's a very relevant point about uh, financial discipline and management. Um, staying on the macro level for the aviation space, on the one hand, uh, uh, from what I have just heard from all of you, I think there are multiple reasons for us to think that the aviation industry is going to have a steady growth going forward. First of all, the burgeoning middle class and then the urbanization that's happening and then the millennial community is increasing. So there are good, in good reasons for us to believe that the aviation industry is a peak. But on the other hand, we also are seeing that a lot of the airlines are uh, under turbulent circumstances, some are closing down. Uh, the demand on the one side is high, but on the other hand, uh, the supply is probably uh, not on par with the demand, and we see a lot of demand for uh, low-cost airlines, no-frills airlines, and the consequence of all that is they are not able to run it profitably. So do you see some kind of uh, consolidation happening going forward? In the, airline, in the aviation space where we see a more balanced demand supply situation. See, when we are talking about consolidation, uh, let us talk about it. It's a very common, very natural thing regardless of which industry you are. When the competition builds up, then you got to also be ready to compete. And there is a saying, when the situation gets tough, the tough get going. Right? So what is toughness in this? I already mentioned discipline, financial discipline. Run the airline regardless of what is happening. For example, I will just uh, say, example of Kingfisher, let's say. 
we talk of King Fisher, constantly there is one argument being raised, ATM <coughs> prices were high. ATM prices were not high only for King Fisher. They were high for Indigo also. They were high for other airlines also. The question is, did you manage it well? That's the issue. So, in terms of consolidation, what happens? It is the bigger fish eats the smaller fish. So, what normally in the business world is called the sharks. So, every airline, let us say Indigo at present, has been growing. When I joined Indigo 10 years, 11 years back, they had 31 aircraft. Today, they have 58 aircraft. 650 aircraft are waiting to be delivered. So, therefore, they are going to grow. And they have a business model where they generally accept one of the quarters recently, they have always been in profit. So, their strategy is a corporate world. Each one is out trying to out one over the other one. So, therefore, if you have a strategy, if they are growing at this pace, they will certainly evolve policies where something should collapse so that ready made pilots, all available, all ground staff, everybody should just come towards them because they are getting at the rate of, I will tell you, last year itself they got something more than 30 aircraft. And I already told you that they need 14 pilots per aircraft. So if you, let us say, if I offer you an example I am giving, they may not be realistic figures. If I offer your pilots, let us say I will give you 7 months salary as bonus if you come and join me because they need ready made pilots. Fine. Very few will not take that fight. Now suddenly inflow into coming into one airline. <coughs> Other airline can't cope because there is shortage of pilots, aeroplanes are standing on the ground, lease is to be paid, everything has to be done. So what is happening? Crumbling starts. So there was natural phenomena that these sorts of things happen in the corporate world. Let us talk of when we talk of whether it is Boeing or Airbus. In the past, there were Lockheed Martin, Caviar, British Aerospace. What has happened to all that? Today there is only mainly two manufacturers. That is the Airbus and Boeing. What has happened to the rest? They collapsed. You can't sustain and therefore <coughs> after that only comes up a little bit in Bombardier or Embraer, something like that. So as far as this book, this phenomenon is very natural. There will be consolidation and consolidation then finally is leading up to a much stronger wherein some of the countries there are monopoly laws. It may not be allowed so easily. I don't know about the laws in India but certainly it happens more often. So therefore, consolidation will take place, airlines will shut down because this competition will continue. Bigger fish eats the smaller fish. How it happens, I am just giving you one example. Okay. If you have to grow, you have to have trained pilots. Like today, there are about 400 pilots, foreign pilots who are flying in. Because you can't cope the demand like you mentioned. Because to train a pilot, just to be able to start flying with a license, it may take up to two years. So, in short, which is the shortcut way? I just mentioned. So, that's all that I have to say at this moment. And in the low cost airline, India still is not working as per the concept of low cost airline. And I will tell you the reason. I, have, I was sent to study in Frankfurt as well as in Sweden. Ryanair operations. The operations are totally, totally different. And now I will tell you because we linked it to Jet Air. So the story starts from there. <coughs> what did I see? It was raining, snowing in Frankfurt. Four people were doing total turnaround the aircraft <coughs> going in just 20 minutes after switch off. The cabin crew used to go to the airport to vote the passengers. First 60 passengers who you know, checked in were allowed to go first so that they could go and occupy the seat that they wanted. So that there is a group of family of four people or five people. 
So they were allowed to go first because they came in first. So with the result, everybody tried to reach the airport early. The people who check in too early. And with this, so when they went, and also they were operating from airports, which was secondary airports, not the main fat food airport. It could be another one nearby 20 kilometers away. For example, in this particular case, like it could be HL airport, which is nearby, other one is far away. And it is not so so well utilized in terms of traffic on the thing. So if the every cost was low, same thing I saw in Ryanair. So in 20 minutes, an aircraft going with four people, four person only. You know, turning the aircraft around was amazing. Here it could be 70 to 20 people milling around the aircraft and why did it happen? That also I will teach And because it was it was an uh, operation when people were running to the aircraft because they were from secondary airport, just walk across the terminal. No coach required, no bus required, no this thing, uh, air trans even transportation required for the pilot. They travel in trains and suddenly come and arrive. So that is low cost airline. No, in terms of uh, hotel stay at night. So this is what I saw there. But here when it happened, this is where the jet air is coming in. So when Airtaker wanted to do that, they realized that tickets were being sold for one rupee. Even for one rupee ticket was being sold. Okay, first come, first buy. And whosoever bought it early, they were getting very, very cheap tickets. Now this is the boss of the jet airs came into play. I don't know what to say. <laughs> you go to the right kind of people, get the right decision to ban air taken from doing all this. Okay? They said, sorry, you have to allot seat numbers. Passengers cannot walk across the dam. All those things were given because jet air was feeling a threat. So therefore these rules were brought in. And with the result, not allowed to function as a low cost airline so that they should not be able to sustain. But this sort of corporate war continues. He succeeded. In the long run, they say if you if you dig a ditch for others to fall, you also fall into it sometimes. Okay, so finally jet air has collapsed. Not only that, I can tell you to what extent it was going on. One day I was on finance or at night. Behind me was a jet with aircraft. When I was just, let us say, seven miles from touchdown, I was taken away to do an orbit and brought the jet engines to land so that that should function on time and air deckens should be delayed. Okay? And when I asked him the reason, what is the reason? He said, you are a slow aircraft. On finals, everybody is same speed. <laughs> so therefore, all this was happening, so therefore what happened between behind the scene between Jet Airways and Kingfisher and all that, I wouldn't be privy to it. Maybe we can contact some people who will be more knowledgeable about it. These are games that we play high places. So I really don't know what, but I've just given you one story as to what the Jet Airways was doing that time. So very possible they must have done a lot of what you are saying. That's all I can say. Just to add to that, I don't know how many of you have heard of this book called Flight of Vultures by Joby Jadul. Excellent three chapters on jet airways and how they mucked it up, Vedanta, how they mucked it up. Read that book. Then, uh, you know, you will enlighten yourself on this question about jet airways. Uh, Sonal, this one is for you. Uh, I think when you started off your career about 14, 15 years ago, uh, Jobs in, uh, let's say, cabin crew or becoming an air hostess, I think it was, it was quite glamorous that time, 15, 20 years ago, so especially for people from tier 2 towns, tier 3 towns. So is it equally glamorous today? What is your take? Do you see people coming, rushing to you, asking how to become an air hostess? What is the need to do Where can I go for an interview? Yeah, so this is a very when I started my career back in 2005, uh, I come from a family where I've seen uh, an aviator family basically. A lot of my cousins, my family members are five years of group. So I started aspiring to becoming a captain from a very, very young age. 
and what attracted me was the glamour, I'll be very honest to you. Uh, when I joined the airline, the aviation, the glamour was at, it, was at its peak. The out of 1,000 people standing in hot sun for a walking interview, only 10 people were handpicked uh, based on how you looked, how you present yourself, and how you talk. Uh, gradually, in 5 years, 10 years, 15 years of flying, I have seen the, the competition is reduced because a lot of young minds are at work. They, were, they are very energetic, very aspiring, very ambitious, and we want people like that. Uh, I wouldn't say the glamour is completely died down, but I feel it's taken a back seat. Uh, airlines like Kingfisher and Jet Airways to an extent brought up the glamour to, the, to its peak, but now people are there in the market to make money. Uh, airlines like Indigo or Go Air, their strategy is very clear cut, that we are in the market to make money. The option to take the passengers from destination A to destination B. We don't really want models on board the aircraft. As long as, as long as you can take care of the passengers' need, comfort, and safety, you are able to go. So, in terms of glamour, I would not, as I said, I would not say it's completely tied down. It's still glamorous because uh, there will be days where you're having breakfast probably in, in Bangkok, and by the time you, you come to the next flight, you probably be having lunch in Singapore. So, the glamour is there, but it's taken a back seat. Primarily because people, the airline owners have become more focused towards what the core agenda is to have a cabin crew for, on board for. Not for a personal, uh, say, a model on board, but primarily to look after the needs of a passenger. So, glamour is, is still there, but take care of yes. Just one point to break the glamour bubble with your body. <laughs> Remember a cabin attendant is for safety primarily. <coughs> Get over those visions that you have. It's very clear her job is safety first. And that is why, uh, you know, uh, I know that uh, with you dance scheme or whatever it is, it all looks very nice to see, uh, like I'm asking, uh, answering his question on tire two, tire three cities. In my uh, aviation career, I have seen this change from, uh, from the metros to tire two and tire three cities. And very nice to see people coming out. And uh, I just give one question to a lot of people, though controversial it may sound. But uh, you see the more people from the northeast in the airline. Have you ever wondered why? The Lord, in its in his own way, gave them Christianity. They knew English, so today they are sitting in your restaurants, in all the service industry. Then we have seen anybody from Kashmir do this. Controversial. Can I just say something? Um, how many of you have seen Sully? Have you seen Sully? The movie, uh, you've seen Sully. So it's a great movie to see uh, some of the things that we are discussing here. You must see Sully and the other book that I want to mention is Sipki Fly. It's written by Kevin Gopinath. I don't know how many of you have read. How many of you have read uh, Sipki Fly? Anyone has read Sipki Fly? A book by Captain Gopinath. Very nice book. Very nice. Very nice book. There is a there is a story that he describes there, which is um, you know refers to your previous question. Correct. Where we we at Air Deccan we were threatened that you know if we went there was a certain service provider um, who was a, a payment gateway. You know low cost companies, low cost airlines don't like to do too much to the travel agent. They want to sell directly. So at the time. In India, there was only one payment gateway provider for e-commerce companies, and that happened to be with ICICI. And ICICI was a, a big financer for Jet Airways. Um, so apparently, they were threatened that you know if you if you gave your payment gateway to a Deccan, we would pull out the salary account from. You. But these are this is not just this is this is normal business rivalry. It's uh, you know it's not right to blame one. It's not as if they were the last people to do it. It's still happening. Um, if you can, there are lobbies in, in the U.S. You have lobbying is actually uh, very much uh, legal. You can hire lobbyists in, in Washington and lobby to keep the policy in your favor. So these are normal business rules. I, I should I you know happens in Hong Kong. There was an airline that wanted to come in and the. Regulators said, no, you don't have this in your application. 
Singapore, same thing. They are considered to be a very open uh, place for doing business. But when their own airline was threatened, they didn't let AirAsia establish um, uh, a company in Singapore. So I would just like to put this in context here that this is not just us. This everything is fair in in business, you know, in, in law. You know, this is not just happening here. This is a norm in any place in the world where you are doing business. It's part of being a capitalist where you want your rival to go down. And sometimes these are fair methods and sometimes they are a little bit under the carpet. You see, what I want to add about Glamour, maybe a different viewpoint. When we say Glamour, Glamour is in whose mind? It's the prospective Glamour. If she thinks that this is a glamorous job, she'll go for it. In that context, you see an airline interview that takes place for cabin two. I'm sure she'll be able to tell you if she's been there in any of the road shows or something. It's a huge amount. And I was just sharing with her before the before we met here that when I was doing I was doing CRM classes for cabin two also. And if I asked them on the very first question, I always asked, how many of you had a dream to be a cabin crew? Hundred percent wanted to be. And that was that was true. And even today when I ask, when we go to our offices every year when we go for refresher and all, when I ask this question, hundred percent answer comes, yes, that was our dream at the age of 18 and 20. So therefore, glamour is in whose mind? The person who is applying for a job, she sees it as glamour. Not you and I. We don't matter as far as that goes. So yes, is it a glamorous job? Yes, it is definitely a glamorous job. So if you ask the people who want to take up that job, that's where they go. And when it comes to benefits, she can tell you a lot. She's already mentioned a lot in terms of whether it is travel around the world or a five star hotel stay and air conditioning pickup. <coughs> After your just 12 pass, the salaries that you get. And then what is the image that a person has of the family? A very well cultured, well educated, who knows how to conduct herself, carry herself. That is the image people seek to have. So therefore in my mind, yes, it's still a very glamorous job. <clears throat> Since we are talking about glamour, I would like to address this question to Captain Chidambaram and get insight from a pilot's perspective. Uh, for a non-aviation person, it does look like a glamour uh, to have a job flying a thousand feet high and having a nature's view. Uh, but as the saying goes, the grass is always green on the other side. Uh, but for a pilot, uh, how is the journey going to be like in the initial days from the time when uh, uh, you get into the cockpit and do your first few takeoffs until the time when you actually land and give a sigh of relief that you have accomplished something. In between the journey, I think you go through a lot of uh, stressful moments, uh, mixed emotions like fear, like fun, like uh, ecstasy. Uh, but at the same time, you also have a sense of responsibility that one wrong move or a wrong judgment could jeopardize hundreds of lives. So, could you share some of those experiences that pilots would experience in their early days? Okay, now let me give you the disclaimer first. <laughs> first is, if you thought you became a pilot and there is no more study, that's the furthest <laughs> Uh, as pilots, you do uh, uh, two sets of what, like you use the term called refresher. We go back to ground school, uh, this is the only profession where you go back to ground school twice a year. If I was a normal MBA and going on, I never go back to uh, MBA school. No. So if you ever think you've got to put away your books, sorry. You, you will continue with your books if you carry on till the age 65. And 
the amount of add-ons and uh, you know uh, kind of extra notes that one gets and as you build let's just talk of a good professional let's just not talk of the run of the mill as a good professional you will continue wanting to increase your knowledge so that uh, thirst of knowledge as a pilot in aviation is something which you need to have if somebody told you just join aviation for aviation uh, glamour i think that's very far away from you and uh, once you kind of uh, uh, the initial training is fairly grueling it has its sinusoidal moments where uh, sometimes you feel that you've done okay you feel you've done well then suddenly go down because uh, something happened done well because when he talks of refresher remember every 6 months you go back to the simulator you practice your emergencies you you are assessed for those emergencies and when i say assessed if i do not perform i fail i fail my license is not renewed therefore my pay is stopped every 6 months if i fail my medical the <coughs> next day my pay stops so please understand this is why i said let me give you the disclaimers first so if you got to get out to it it is a profession where you need to study and be serious about your job i am not saying 100% of the pilots are uh, dull boys no there are uh, 50% dull there are 50% uh, not so dull let's put it that way okay and i'm <laughs> also, I, i'm of the firm opinion that that it's your language and soft that takes you further okay so not the look so uh, that i mean being said that i mean being said you know so so uh, the uh, the question is that uh, it is um, you know it's, um, it's a profession which you need to take seriously because as you move the ladder the responsibilities given to you are more and if you understand your responsibilities your flight starts the moment that you report to what we call dispatch that means that is where you go through your your virtually self brief if you understand my term that means just documents are put in front of you you are expected to read through them you are expected to decide a few things depending on you the advantage on the other side is yes you will have your moments as what acha says you will have your moments of ecstasy you will have your moments of tension you will have your moments like suppose you are recovering in delhi on a foggy day when you can see nothing beyond your nose and uh, you are coming close to the ground so you are tense yes you are tense the automatics are on yes but uh, that doesn't uh, sort of uh, you know keep you away from the job at hand and ecstasy is yes like what she said when you do a landing in all foggy weather and you touch down in it just about she's just there just about few lights very interesting the um, other part is yes the um, uh, the profession takes you through time zones through fatigue and through rest if you not understood the concept of fatigue rest and time zone then uh, you know you are asking for trouble you are operating in the twilight zone so that is the important <coughs> Okay, when I when I entered here, I was greeted by Niti, and she said, "Can I carry your bags?" <laughs> So when I was, when I was, you know, when I was uh, in school, we used to be told "Nalaik Bachche Ka Bas Tha Bhai" because he doesn't know what is the curriculum where it is. That is not the case. I just came from CPAT, that is my aviation training center, center of excellence, and I was conducting classes in the morning, and I came straight from there. Like what he said, your books don't close; they don't close even afterwards. Okay, you want to really help somebody. That is the first thing. So that is very true. 
in terms of if anyone has read a book by Stranger to the Ground by Richard Park, and you tell him every pilot is as good as his last landing. That means you got to prove day in, day out, every time. You can't assume and you can't live on past stories. Which means there is only way to do that is preparation. And a person like me always says, flying is done at home, not in the cockpit. Which means you prepare and go to the work well. To answer that special question of in terms of how dense you feel, once you close the door of the cockpit and get in, actually you forget everything else except how to perform. And that is all that is in front of you. And there is no fear if you are prepared well. Rain, snow, and anything, hell or high water, it just does not matter. Because it is focused. Like the object, you only see the eye of the parrot and nothing else. So you see the dog at hand and that's all that you are doing. You have no idea how many passengers are there, what is there. You know that I got to achieve this successfully. And that's all that you are doing. So really speaking, if you are a professional pilot, there is no tension. There is no tension. Because you want to just achieve and you are doing it for yourself, for self-pride and for self-achievement, that if you want to make sure the task that you were given, you perform it to perfection. And that is what a real professional pilot is. That's all. So, exams every six months. How many of you still want to be a pilot? <laughs> <laughs> Please raise your hand. <laughs> Please raise your hand. Uh, so apart from flying jobs, Gaurav, would you like to throw some light on what kind of roles may the APM or BTA aviation management will make of them? Thank you, sir. So, yeah, I think we've talked a, a lot about the... So this industry is big, it's not just, of course, the, should I say, most glamorous part or the most visible part of the industry is the pilots and, and you know, the, they have a uniform and, and they travel. Uh, there's also the cabin crew, uh, also very visible, interact a lot with the, the, the customers. But there, there are also other parts to this industry which uh, have a lot of potential in terms of uh, generating jobs and they should be paid serious attention to. Now, um, <clears throat> some of them in our country, as the industry develops, we have a big uh, demand for people at the airport. So because they are ground jobs, you don't really, uh, they're not that glamorous and they're not heard about, but airports are very profitable companies. And, and I said this to you, Asha. Um, there are um, more and more airports being built. Many more private companies are now wanting to become part of the airport, uh, you know, they want to own airport and run them manage the airports, uh, there's GMR, there's GVK, there is now Adani's, uh, there was a point of time when Tatras wanted to get in, there are also foreign <coughs> companies, um, ADP has just come in, there is, uh, Changi has invested in India before, Changi is from Singapore. So airports are a big generator of jobs, and the kind of jobs that you have, uh, they are on the ground, they don't fly, but other than that, you still, are pretty much part of the industry. So you are at the airport, either you are handling passengers, helping them check in, or you are part of the security infrastructure. The airport uh, checks your bags, or you are part of the cargo, uh, which is, again, not glamorous, but it's very profitable. So, um, you know, there are a lot of jobs behind the scenes, which may have many other good qualities that you, you know, you, you probably uh, do not see so explicitly, but they are good jobs. So in airports, there are also firefighters, many firefighters because <coughs> their shift is only six hours. Um, so there are, if it's a 24-hour airport, where <coughs> Anglo International Airport is, then you have four shifts. Um, and uh, that means that they hire a lot of people. And they go through a, they go through a specialized screening 
from the management point of view, there are jobs uh, not just in airports and operations, but there are also jobs on the commercial side of both airport and airlines. On the commercial side of the airline, you have jobs in managing, the, this is the business side of the airline. Um, it's different from operation. This is more about trying to see the industry as a, as a business, uh, which means that it concentrates on aspects like pricing. Um, and, and you might think pricing is, you know, there are usually about 10 fares, so what is so, what is so difficult, or why it does it require so many people? But pricing in airline business is a science. It requires a lot of detailed attention. Um, there is revenue management because, like you can see today on your phones, you get so many different, you get so many different packages that even the most seasoned person would not know which package to buy. It's really confusing. If you're on a pre-paid, uh, you know, you get sometimes $5.99, $3.99, you don't know which one is it. That is being deliberately done because it's it's a way of, you know, selling. So um, pricing is a discipline in, in airlines which requires a lot of detailed attention. Um, it is mastered over many years. It's not a simple thing because uh, there is complexity in, in you know how that pricing is put forward. So pricing and revenue management is one very big area where there are uh, many. I would say in the, an airline. I can give you an example. An airline like Indigo would have more than a hundred people in revenue management department managing this on a day-to-day -day basis, looking at flights and trying to see where you know they can either put in. Um, a higher price or they can you know see if, if they can close it for sale and you know, always whether they can overbook things like that now this is I mean this is very layman term I'm putting it but it's actually quite a complex thing the other functions on the commercial side if it is a big airline that goes international for example in Air India you will have uh, a person who manages um, so it all starts from somebody who manages the routes. You know, you have to decide, Air India would be a wrong example, but uh, somebody has to say, is it going to be profitable if I fly from Bangalore to uh, London? So somebody has to look at all the costs that are, uh, you know, that are involved in such a long route. If it's an 11 hour route, you're overflying so many different countries. Every country charges you an overflying charge. And so therefore, if you're flying, uh, I can give you an example. If you're flying from Johannesburg or from a land base, if you're flying uh, crossing an entire continent, uh, and you're fl over flying many countries, you're going to pay a lot more. It's a much more expensive flight than if you were flying over water. So these are charges that a route planner has to take into account. It's a complex <coughs> calculation because there are many sets of crew involved. There are catering costs. There are many different cost items that have to be taken into account before coming to a conclusion that network planning or route planning is a, you know, this route is feasible or not. So, and then there are subsets. So once you've decided, once the company has decided this is the route that we're going to fly, then of course, operational people from flight planning will get involved and see how we will do this. Are we going to be able to, we have mentioned there are seven sets of pilots uh, for each aircraft. They have to decide which one is going. And there are very detailed rules managing fatigue, uh, you know, how many hours you can. This is all very uh, detailed. So there's a lot of software required for all of this in large companies. And there are now jobs being generated. For you, my message is. There was a time when you could just have a degree and you were set. And most of the training, or most of the uh, you know useful part was taught in the companies. Today, the expectation from the company is, I want to pick up kids. I don't really care whether they're MBAs or BPAs or MSc or BA. Can what skills do they have? Even when you've done 20 years, they they don't really want to know you know, what uh, qualifications that you have. Uh, 
um, what they want to know is, I want an analyst. Can that analyst uh, prepare information for me the way I want to see it? Can he operate Excel? Can he, is he good in communication? If I'm sitting with, if I'm an international airline, I'm going to be talking to people <coughs> who speak with a different accent. Uh, is he able to understand them? Is he good in making himself understood? So communication is a big important part. That's a very important skill. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are paying a lot more attention to what is written in the book and what the theory is rather than in imparting these practical skills that is what is used in the job. So I would anyway, you know, when we were coming in, uh, computers were not so, you know, they were not everywhere. I started using the internet uh, in 1995 and uh, the first time I had, a, I had a cousin who sent me an email from the US and I really honestly hit on Hotmail and I really honestly thought she's working for some CI house as possible. How can somebody send me a message from, you know, there were no cell phones and there was no internet. Um, so a lot of people who are working in the higher management level of the airlines, they know the business, but they may not necessarily have the time to get into the details of finding all this information which is what young people are expected to do when they join the company. I would expect somebody to be fantastic on Excel or on PowerPoint, helping me prepare all this information. I should just be able to tell them, please do this and you know, then, um, or providing insights to me. I looked at all the detailed numbers and this is what. So this is, this is the entry level jobs that are available. Thousands of such jobs are available. Uh, in fact, we don't have enough people, good people who can uh, most of the time they get trained inside once they are already inside the inside the company. This is on the commercial side, very exciting. Once again, this is something that um, there's a study done uh, where they say which part of the air. A lot of people think you know uh, I want to go and be at the top of the area. I want to be a the goal for young people is I want to be a CEO. It's another thing that they will realize later on, but. but they did a study and they, they saw a lot of people, uh, if they were, a lot of people in the Indian carriers are also from the revenue management background. Uh, this is not to say the other, other parts are not important. It is just to say that it's an exciting field. One should pay attention to it and, um, you know, this, this is something that uh, you just need to have skills for and you should uh, not bother about what is there in your curriculum, but try and see uh, what you can pick up, what will, you know, something that will be useful to you in your jobs. So a very long answer. <laughs> Somebody else. You mentioned about the commercial part of yes. the training. So uh, coming to the technical part, uh, maybe Sona can answer this first before I move to the this part. Uh, in your role, you have to transcend across uh, cultures, across languages, across demographies. Uh, in your training, could you actually be consciously trained to be able to uh, create an excellent corporate, uh, customer experience uh, across the cultures? Uh, is it part of your training or is it something that you pick up along the job? That's one of my favorite questions. I don't know why because um, I have sat through of uh, recruitment drives when I was rejected. And uh, it's a very funny thing and I, I don't know if most of the people understand that customer service is not a profession. That's my understanding. It's a skill that you acquire. Now either you're born with a personality where you have customer service centricity in yourself or you develop it either ways. But if you do not have that, then I, I unfortunately, uh, aviation is not an industry meant when you don't understand, you don't have the customer sense to. Now, uh, for, uh, Mr. Agarwal spoke about all uh, commotion uh, planning of an airline. Not just that, he spoke about research and development that goes through when we decided a, a sector, a ticketing pricing and everything. There are a lot of other departments also which have high, really high scope. 
people who like to teach can, can get into training. There are a lot of subjects that you can teach starting from grooming to soft skills to safety to CRM as uh, Captain Gill was also is still teaching uh, CRM. So these are the centricity small micro departments which we have in aviation, any airline that you fly whether in India or outside India. These are the basic departments that we have. Now, if you look at other airlines outside India, uh, we have many more departments which look after other things. How to be uh, emotionally humane. Now, when you fly with a lot of people who are from different nationalities, different backgrounds, their language is a, is a barrier, they train you accordingly how to comprehend, how to understand, how to make yourself understood to the other person. So it's a very detailed and a lengthy training that you go through. And it is interesting because you you explore yourself. You understand, you realize where your weaknesses are, where your strengths lie, and you work accordingly. You work a little more harder towards your weaknesses and a little and you pay a little less attention towards your strength because you know that's what you would add. So yes, the training part itself is a very lengthy and a very detailed process where Everything is looked after from the way you talk, how you present yourself, how to address people, and how to be a little more sensitive towards people. We don't want robots on board the aircraft. If we wanted, we could have just planted a robot on board the aircraft. The reason we have human beings on board is because we want that human touch, we want that human sensitivity. Before a person could just press the call bell, I should probably be a little more proactive to understand that it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, there is a possibility that he's pressing the call bell for a glass of water and not for a newspaper. So uh, all of these things you need to acquire along with time and you go through a lengthy training detail uh, process as well. Very interesting. Sometimes you may end up with very demanding customers yes. and your challenge to keep your calm and uh, yes. Captain Gill was mentioning about uh, the pilot is only as good as the last landing. So when you talk of training for a pilot uh, post his initial license, what exactly uh, are the skills that you need to keep uh, improving upon uh, to make sure that he's, he stays relevant and efficient, not just in the job market but also in terms of customer service? A pilot is not just a pilot who is a labor class, who is able to do what a North Russia guy does. That is, here is the clutch, here is the gear, and you push. So clutch in that case, I can say, is the throttle in the aircraft, accelerator, and the gear, is, you can say, is the stick with which you fly. He's supposed to be a manager. Like the Indian Air Force typically says, an officer first and a professional later. I think you should also know how to conduct yourself. Recently, you must have read in the newspaper a one Indigo pilot has been suspended for three months because he threatened a passenger and made you arrested, an old age passenger. And then the daughter and the mother. It is an unacceptable behavior. Unbordered. So therefore, there was another story which came about four months back. Normally you see when you when you go to the aircraft, you see sometimes the pilot is roaming around outside. What he is doing is he is checking the external condition of the aircraft. That is, is it fit to fly? Every time he is supposed to check. After he did the check when he was coming up, the passenger sometimes there is a long queue, somebody is taking time to sit down, put his baggage. So he didn't get his way coming onto the boarding the aircraft. When he didn't get his way boarding the aircraft, he got into argument with passengers. And he replayed with one passenger. Because ego. He didn't give me wage. Whereas the simple thing is, the passengers are intelligent people. They know unless you go to the cockpit, flight can't start. If you just wait there, they'll give you way. You don't have to demand. 
if you just stand there and maybe a smile and everybody will let you go. But just to make an ego issue of, of an issue that I do not give me way and then you get into argument and you deeply in that you are a passenger with no style or a passenger who is unworthy of sitting in the same time. Yeah. So in short, you are just not a pilot. You are supposed to be a manager. And the other important trait that a person must have, you see earlier it used to be called something used to be called <coughs> as he is the captain. Today it has changed to commander and to command. And why is that is? Because there was a big conflict of what we call empire building. The head cabin crew said this area is mine and the pilot said this area is mine. <coughs> they both in the same aeroplane. Like recently what I read a wonderful story about one gentleman wrote a story saying that I was traveling and I was busy with my uh, iPad or laptop or whatever he was doing. And then after some time, he said, I looked at the neighboring passenger and I recognized him. And I, I asked him, are you Mr. Narayan Murthy? He said, yes. He said, I thought you would be traveling business class. So he said, why? Do business class reach the destination earlier than others? <laughs> I will also reach with them. Why should I only think of business plan? So what am I saying? A person of that stature has this thought. So pilot is not, should not think himself that he is some, something supreme. He is just doing the customer service. And therefore he has to conduct himself properly. And what is this line saying? That means you should not only feel important for your role, take the responsibility of carrying so many passengers safely from place A to B, their top priority is their comfort and they should be relaxed. So apart from your piloting skill, you got to know how to conduct yourself. You got to be a manager, you got to be a leader and you got to be ready to take on responsibilities. Remember a cabin crew, many of them are 18 years old, 19 years old, a young girl Many people say that's your responsibility when a difficult situation comes. A person like me <coughs> always say, your problem is my problem. So kindly share with me. One should have that sense of responsibility if you're a real commander. So coming back to what I was saying that my vocation was there, that's why it's been renamed as pilot in command or commander. So it's become a legal thing that once that you board the aeroplane, you're the commander of the flight. What you say goes. But that should not be a sense of, you know, an image that I am the boss. Yes, you are the boss to rectify things, to address others' problems. Take charge of the situation and don't hide behind the door, it's closed and don't open it. And really speaking, one has faced some situation where it was not. That I don't want to take more time. I can tell you some stories of it. So I suppose this address is sure. No. <coughs> so any questions from audience? Please raise your hand. Any questions? Yes, please. Able to stop or control the facilities or staff of the airport being driven by hijackers or terrorists? If yes, how can we control it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me just repeat your question. If I understand you correctly, your question is uh, how can we stop uh, you know <coughs> bad people driving the staff of the airport to cause trouble? Okay. <laughs> See, in the Indian airports, you've got six systems. That means you don't go only to a single system. You start with the gate and you've got like six systems to increase the aircraft. So therefore, uh, India is by far one of the most uh, checked passengers before you reach. 
So you can, uh, the only way out is deterrence. A chap is not, because if you start driving all six people in the chain, remember word will get out. Because the famous story of, if I tell you a secret, you won't tell that person say, I don't tell anybody, huh? I told you. Actually, <laughs> 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 what he said, in terms of keeping secrets, he said the only way you can keep a secret is if the other person is dead. <laughs> now in hijacker, you are talking about driving, who all will you drive? You start at the airs, you want to get into the airport, there is a CSL service. Then you go into the security, there is another one. Then you go through the final the gate check-in, there is another one. Then there is security at the aircraft. But yet with all this, like what he said, India has the highest number of security checks that you do. Yet are you aware the highest number of hijackings that have taken place yes. is in India? Yeah. So the Bureau of Civil Aviation Security once was giving a talk and he was saying we in India do this, we in India do this. So my one question suddenly flattened it. I said why 17 hijacks have taken place here which is the highest in the world. So which means to work ethics and how we conduct, how we deal with it. That is the problem of hijacking. But there is an interesting part to it. There is a pilot who is from Ethiopian airline. He was hijacked thrice. Oh. Okay. It's a very interesting video. You can go and watch. He was from Ethiopia going to Tanzania. And when somebody who had run away from conflict from the jail, he was flying a 777. And he told him, take me to Australia. And he told him, I don't have the fuel to go to Australia. Because I was just going to Tanzania. Okay. And he said, no, I know, you can go, you're just fooling me. So he kept, he kept questioning him and he said, I'll shoot you and I'll do this and all that. So the pilot went a little off the coast of Africa and put it into a slow turn where he couldn't find out that this chap is just orbiting, going round and round over there, giving him an impression I'm going over the sea to Australia. But he was keeping that land in contact, where should he be running out of fuel, he will go and land in Tanzania. Okay. Unfortunately, this guy saw it. So he said, I will shoot you, I will kill you if you don't do it. And he forced him to run out of fuel. And he landed on the beach, and that is where this was his third hijack he was facing. Poor guy. But he survived. Okay. <laughs> so it all happens. But it's not an easy job. If you were going on a flight, let us say, to let us say to Srinagar from anywhere, rest assured there will be marshals on board. Okay. So preventive measures are taken, but it's not easy to do. And if you happen to be hijacking a German or Israeli aircraft, rest assured they will come after you. They are going to you. Thank you. Hijacking has gone out of fashion. It was, you know, a preferred way of protesting, or there were a lot of political movements and. Uh, one answer that I'd like to give to you, of course, there are, we are wearing different hats. The hat that I'm wearing, the answer is technology. You have today, the Israelis have, you know, they observe people. There's also there's human behavior that you can monitor. They observe all the, all the people who are boarding. Uh, they look at them, profile them. Uh, but there's also technology you can use. Uh, today you have face profiling. Technology can be both useful, it can also be used by them, by the evil guys. So it's both ways, but the chances are that authorities are using technology that is ahead and it works. So the answer is technology. There is a, your bag goes through a five stage check uh, for explosives and stuff like that uh, before it gets into the aircraft. Yes, please. Uh, my question is to uh, Barnaba. Uh, you were there in the industry. What was your management style or what uh, was your strategy to manage the customers? There is no particularly strategy that you can uh, you know, it's not foolish. There's it's nothing in the book that you can just really have to understand. It depends from situation to situation, but the most important tactic that you can use in every situation is to stay calm and patient. 
whether the situation is uh, the customer is angry about something which is not your fault uh, and trying to blame the airline for something or whether it's something that you're supposed to give it to the passenger but you don't have it as a crew on board the aircraft. Any other situation, whether you have it with the passenger or with the fellow crew or with anyone, the best strategy, I wouldn't use the word strategy, uh, but rather I would probably just say have this quality of being patient and calm and you will win all the battles there. This answer the question. Anybody else? Yeah. Great. Uh, so this question goes to everyone. How is your experience so far? You have been in various industries, fields of aviation. How is your uh, experience so far? Till then, what what changes have you seen? Changes? What aspects? In aviation, yeah. You work in aviation for forty six years. Yes. For forty six years of experience. So what changes do you? Experiences. So changes may be experience. The very first change that you can say is that when I was in Deccan, I saw there was a old man from Rajasthan wearing a dhoti, wearing that kind of a typical traditional saga, and with a stick he was walking and going up the ladder. And that is what the Gopinath made it that everyone can fly. So that is the biggest change that has taken place in India. The costs have come down so much compared to what it used to be. They become affordable for affordable people. Then earlier there was only one airline and that was the Air India or Indian Airlines. Government sponsored. And just to give you an idea again when if it is collapsing, other day I read the newspaper. 300 crores of bills are still to be paid by some parliament of the airlines. Okay. So, the major change is that so many other airlines privatized have taken place. So many more airlines have come up because the competition has become stiff, so it has become affordable. And these are the major changes in terms of that. One big change is that now you can go to any place, even Timbuktu. By air. Earlier it was the case. We only went to the metro cities. Today, the smallest of place that you can think of. And more is going to come up. Like there are six more airports which are being private and public sector. Whether it is Jaipur, and there is a long list of aeroplanes that is coming. So, the expansion, the affordability, the size, options. What do you do today? You Google and go on to what is that dot com and you look for the lowest cost of the ticket that you get. Earlier there was no such thing. In 2003 also, take it or leave it. Jet Airways, route to lose. And then there was a Air India. And to some extent, even Sahara was there. Not much to choose from. Today you can just go to what is that travel not for a mind or something to go in Make and you can get it. So I suppose I have my more experience. I just number will tell you about this. But if you longer than me, the, the only thing is what I have seen is the elitism of aviation changing to a mode of transportation. I think that is the greatest, uh, you know, other concept. You moved out of elitism and then you moved into. Uh, um, just as a mode of transportation, which has happened in the U.S. long back. In fact, I uh, have you people heard of Mr. Rono Dutta, now the boss of Indigo? No? Okay, then educate yourself. Rono Dutta ran United Airlines for the U.S. He gave us a very interesting talk on the development of U.S. airports and the development of infrastructure in the U.S. <coughs> and how like as you see in Bangalore, that's the ideal thing for you. Uh, the airport is located north, and then we expected development to move that way. Unfortunately, we have a lot of you know political uh, situations which don't allow the movement. Otherwise, as a concept, this should have been your second electronic city. You know, and that they should have built up the subsequent infrastructure. If you see places like DFW, if you say places like uh, Michigan. Uh, Milwaukee, all these places, they will show you how the airports develop. 
I mean, um, it's very interesting. Like, uh, like he talked of Silky Fly. I don't know whether you heard of this book called Trucks. Heard of this book? It's written by Hank Gallagher. It's, uh, it's the story of Southwest Airlines. Very interesting read. <laughs> Another question to get back. This happens to be a small Q and A session. Okay. Other than this, this is, these questions are from the students. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, this question is for you, ma'am. What is the essence of being a successful captain? And do you have any experiences that any comments that the passengers passed on you that you remember that you think has been? Fortunately, in 14 years of my flying, I've never had a bad experience. I've had passengers coming back. Uh, so I was in the approach uh, of my colleagues to look after their old parents uh, because they could trust me that they could, they, I could take their old parents from destination A to destination. They didn't know that. I have gone on my parents' 50th wedding anniversary because somebody wanted another flight. I have flown on Christmases. I have never celebrated Diwali for years together with my family. And I have done it not because the company wanted me to do it. I did it because that was my passion and it is still my passion. So don't do it because everybody else is doing it. Do it because you want to do it. You feel you will do the justice. You will be able to justify what you're doing over there whether you want to be a pilot or a crew or, or be on ground or join any of the managerial level. At the end of the day, you need to justify yourself and you get yourself in here. So I would just please just say that, you know, do it because you have a passion for that and that's, that has been my passion and that has what kept me going for 14 years. What is it, uh, you know, a student, this generation? This generation has a lot to offer. Uh, because you're young, you're creative, you can think out of the box, you can quickly be on your toes to handle a situation as compared to a person who's, who's as old as I am, probably. So I may probably just forget something about it, but young kids will not. So this is what I think out of millennials for sure. And one more, uh, do you have any special experience of it like? Can I request you to let those who gave you the question ask instead of you? Yeah, that would be crazy. Yeah, let's please tell them to ask. Let me answer that. Huh? So, uh, there is already so much noise on the street. There is, you know, we love honking and so, so silent airport basically no announcements, right? There are so many announcements that it gets. There used to be so many announcements for a flight leaving, was now it's boring times, stuff like that. It, it used to be, it, you know, as uh, Captain Chidambam said, you are crossing various different time zones. Um, we only think of the Indian market, but if you're traveling long distance, you might be really fatigued, or you might be really tired because you're it's 3 a.m. for you at night. It's the concept of silent airport was developed to make sure that the information is provided to the passengers without being, you know, without being very uh, intrusive on the ear because you might be uh, might be sleeping time for you. So many airports follow this. There is clear guidelines. There are. Where you can see when, when in order to board the flight. So that's why we silent them uh, without any emotions. Yeah. More questions? Yes, please. Sir, uh, why is VTT dependent on wind stop at every airport? Uh, oh. You know, VT is basically uh, all, all countries have a particular designation. Okay, like November N is for US. Now VT is a very controversial uh, this one here because it uh, hangs back to the uh, British era. Okay, so it goes into um, it, you know it is. Uh, yeah. 
So it, it deals with Victoria. Now Victoria is not our, our problem at all. Unfortunately, we have never taken a, uh, you know, a, a country like Bangladesh, Nepal and Pakistan, they have different annotations. So this annotation was there when the British were there earlier in our country. And it continued. We should have taken the, uh, you know, otherwise you will lose your uh, notation after some time. If you see certain countries, because of the amount of countries that you have, you may not have the adequate to catch up. So they do have an addition, but that is required. Basically, it gives you the country prefix. All, you will see a lot of aircraft in Bangalore Airport in November. So that's come from the US. So that, that's how it is. It's like you know, you put K, A, so and so on your guard. <coughs> So you are asking questions, maybe I can ask you one, yeah. think of it as a quiz. Many airports, in fact, well, we have airports built, being built now, but most airports were built by the British in, in, in India um, during first and, and the second world. Can you name one airport though that was built by the Japanese? Anybody? So it's uh, just, just for, just for you know, some fun. So where did the, let me give you a clue, where did the Japanese reach? Um, how, during, far did they, how, how far did they reach during during the war? Um, they were bombing Calcutta, right? They were bombing, I'm giving you clues. Maybe wrong clues, but. Do you know one airport in India that was built not by the British but by the Japanese? You've seen that Forgotten Army, this one on Amazon Prime. Nobody is a, nobody here is a history or war freak. Nobody reads books on history or war or movies. You must be saying that. <laughs> okay, even on this now is very interesting. So you give up? Shall I already answer that question? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Unfortunately not. You, you set up your own. Wrong direction. Yeah. Yes. So, well. Mumbai. Huh? Mumbai. 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 Yes. Well, they didn't reach that far. Otherwise, you would be speaking Japanese. <laughs> you would know, be speaking Japanese. So, so anyway, the, the, the right answer is Port Blair. Port Blair was built. So the right answer is Port Blair and the reason is that the Japanese in fact took over uh, the Andamans, they, they captured Port Blair and, and then in order to defend it, uh, I think they were there for two years, in order to defend it they built um, the airport there. Anyway, go ahead with the question, maybe you want to ask them. Of 
If you want to do it in real time, that means you should be first medically fit. Even if you think of becoming one, the first step that you should do is get yourself medically cleared, which is called a Vasco Medical. You can go to the DTJ website and you can see how to do the medical, what is it. There are lots of people in Bangalore, especially at Air Force doctors who are specialists in the Indian Air Force. When they were able to do the medical tests, they are the best people to go to because they are the experts. There are two or five of them out there. You can go to DGC website and just search for the thing. They are the ones who have been authorized to do the medical. And then you have to pass certain tests. Before you think of flying, you must pass those tests because they are valid for five years. Your client will be valid only for six months as well as flying. So don't do the mistake of first going and flying, first clear those tests. And then you have to fly 200 hours. The best place to fly, not here, when you can train. Go outside, it happens faster, it costs less. Then you come back, convert to Indian license. And if you want any more information, you can visit Center of Excellence for Aviation Training. And that is CPAT. It's available on Google Center. You can check on that. We will be helping. We will be glad to help you. Anything more than you want. Right. Yeah, are there any scholarships that the government can There are scholarships and they are available. The best is to go to, let us say, these NCC units are out there. Out there. In Bangalore, there will be NCC units. They are the people who will tell you, or go to Jaipur Fire Club. They will tell you which are the category of people or who are entitled to scholarship, and they will tell you to go that means the, where the secretary is of the chief minister over there and they are the ones who give authorization and approval. So best is to go to Jaipur Fight Club. They will tell you who are entitled to receive scholarship and the government funds it. And yes, I am aware of that. Either the NCC people will guide you correctly which is the thing because in the past one year some people did come to me and I did send them to that institute and I learned there are scholarships available. Yeah. I'm your question now. Can you use aviation industry as a future? Can you just repeat your question? If you have completed your quest two now in this generation, can you use aviation industry as a future? When you said this generation, what is aviation? Yes, you are project. Plus two. Yes, the qualification required is only 10 plus 2 with physics and maths. That is the criteria. And in case you have not done physics and maths, not an issue. Go to NIOS, National Institute of Open Schooling. They conduct tests every three months. You can apply there, which is head office in Google. You can Google this National Institute of Open Schooling. And you can appear for physics and maths if you did not take your <coughs> suppose you were not in that stream. Clear those papers and you will qualify for it. Essentially the qualification is 10 plus 2 with physics and maths. That is it. That is it. Yeah. I am saying that head of this is a good one. So you can do when it comes to creating a world class experience, when it comes to good governance, when it comes to turbulences. So uh, maybe we shouldn't get uh, uh, discouraged by those temporary uh, occurrences in terms of career opportunities that the aviation space offers. Yes, there are two things that can be unique when it comes to aviation. One is the management of the time zone and the fatigue as Captain was mentioning. And two, 
uh, aviation should be a choice, not because of the glamour, but because of the passion that we have for the, uh, for the uh, space. On this note, I would like to thank all the panelists for spending valuable time uh, on this splendid Saturday and uh, sharing very valuable insights with all the students. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.